Jesus is the face of the Father's mercy. These words might well sum up the mystery of the Christian faith. The trestle board of the mysteries is the divine dream of humanity. We need constantly to contemplate the mystery of mercy. It is a wellspring of joy, serenity, and peace. Our salvation depends on it. Mercy, the word reveals the very mystery of the most holy trinity. The mystery schools neither restrained nor limited the unfoldment of human institutions. To repeat continually, for his mercy endures forever as the psalm does, seems to break through the dimensions of time and space, inserting everything into the eternal mystery of love. A regenerated human society unfolding under the disciples of the mysteries fashions the eternal city which bears witness to the laws of heaven. Within the very same context of mercy, Jesus entered upon his passion and death, conscious of the great mystery of love that he would consummate on the cross. The mystery system existed in the Western Hemisphere, as landmarks indicate, it must have produced its initiated and adepts. The mission Jesus received from the Father was that of revealing the mystery of divine love in its fullest. Into this body the great plan incarnates so that the form itself built by men through love and consecration is ensouled with the immortal light of the mystery tradition. The mystery of Christ obliges me to proclaim mercy as God's merciful love, revealed in that same mystery of Christ. The mysteries were institutions of liberation and were naturally opposed by groups seeking to keep their people in bondage through ignorance. The struggle was, therefore, between religion as temporal authority and the mystery faith, the internal road of light. They will be a sign of the church's maternal solitude for the people of God, enabling them to enter the profound richness of this mystery so fundamental to the faith. When legitimate authority passed from the church to the orders of the quest, this secret ecclesia drew to itself those who truly loved mankind. Even with the passing of centuries, the rift has not been mended. Theological groups still emphasize a personal salvation achieved by miraculous means. In this case, the very word miraculous stands for the reflected esoteric tradition. It is the unrefined and, for the theological, undefinable science of human regeneration. It is not sufficient to say that beyond the church is only the unknown sphere of God. Actually, beyond the church are the mysteries guarded by the shepherds of men. God makes even more evident his love and its power to destroy all human sin. Reconciliation with God is made possible through the Paschal mystery. We are exploring the mysteries of the atoms and the electrons and have brought the heavenly fire, electricity, to be the servant of our purposes. On Daniel 12, uh, I think this is one of the most important mysteries of the Bible. No one has penetrated the profound mystery of the Incarnation. No one has penetrated the profound mystery of the Incarnation like Mary. Her entire life was patterned after the presence of mercy made flesh. The mother of the crucified and risen one has entered the sanctuary of divine mercy because she participated intimately in the mystery of his love. The mystery schools of antiquity were represented in the Americas by institutions identical in principle and in purpose with those of Asia and the Mediterranean countries. The Church knows that her primary task, especially at a moment full of great hopes and signs of contradiction, is to introduce everyone to the great mystery of God's mercy. The spiritual mysteries of life belong to no one faith, race, or school. From the heart of the Trinity, from the depths of the mystery of God, the great river of mercy wells up and overflows unceasingly. The priesthoods of the sacerdotal colleges, the hierophants of the mystery schools, and the adept masters of the secret societies have been the guardians of man's noblest purpose, the perfection of his own kind. 
The profundity of the mystery surrounding it is as inexhaustible as the richness which springs up from it. Destiny and the mysteries must win, for they are on the side of the great plan. The church is commissioned to announce the mercy of God, the beating heart of the gospel, which in its own way must penetrate the heart and mind of every person. The church knows that her primary task is to introduce everyone to the great mystery of God's mercy. The mysteries of Zibalba, as recorded in the Popova and traditionally associated with the culture hero Votan, were given in such an architectural complex, which served as an entrance to a mysterious world beyond the dimensions of the material mind. There is an aspect of mercy that goes beyond the confines of the church. It relates us to the Judaism and Islam, both of which consider mercy to be one of God's most important attributes. Israel was the first to receive this revelation, which continues in history as the source of an inexhaustible richness meant to be shared with all mankind. As we have seen, the pages of the Old Testament are steeped in mercy because they narrate the works that the Lord performed in favor of his people at the most trying moments of history. Among the privileged names that Islam attributes to the Creator are merciful and kind. This invocation is often on the lips of faithful Muslims who feel themselves accompanied and sustained by mercy in their daily weakness. They too believe that no one can place a limit on divine mercy because its doors are always open. The spiritual mysteries of life belong to no one faith, race, or school. In order to advance itself as the supreme custodian of salvation, ecclesiasticism had to reject the mystery system. In doing so, it did not destroy that system, but forfeited its own place as an instrument for the fulfillment of the great plan. In order to advance itself as the supreme custodian of salvation, ecclesiasticism had to reject the mystery system. In doing so, it did not destroy that system, but forfeited its own place, forfeited its own place, forfeited its own place as an instrument for the fulfillment of the great plan. And lastly, there was yet a third class of men devoted to the higher and more intellectual forms of pagan worship. Initiates of the mysteries, those secret societies which had then woven their nets over the whole of the civilized world. These crept into the fold unaware, as true wolves in sheep's clothing, with deliberate intent to worry and destroy the flock. For from the first, with an instinct of Satan, they marked the Christian as their mortal foe, and perceiving with ever-increasing alarm the failure of persecution after persecution from Nero to Galerius, to suppress the new sect, felt that it could not be exterminated by open warfare and must, therefore, be seduced and corrupted by craft. They marked the Christian as their mortal foe, and perceiving with ever-increasing alarm the failure of persecution after persecution from Nero to Galerius, 
to suppress the new sect, felt that it could not be exterminated by open warfare and must, therefore, be seduced and corrupted by craft. We need to go back to 1994 in a piece of literature known as the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which was approved and released by Pope John Paul II. It says, before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in the place of God and his Messiah who has come in the flesh. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity. In the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. One hour with the beast. One hour with the beast. These have one mind. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose
whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world,